the inadequacy of all his previous efforts convicted Hudson, Hudson as he wrote, How are we going to treat the Lord Jesus Christ with regard to this last command? Shall we definitively drop the title Lord as applied to him? Shall we take the ground that we are quite willing to recognize him as Savior as far as the penalty of sin is concerned, but are not prepared to own ourselves bought with a price? Or Christ as having claim to our unquestioning obedience? How few of the Lord's people have practically recognized the truth that Christ is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. If we can judge God's word instead of being judged by it, if we can give God as much or little as we like, then we are Lord's and he the indebted one to be grateful for our dole and obliged by our compliance with his wishes. If, on the other hand, he is Lord, let us treat him as such. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So it was that at sixty years of age, Hudson Taylor, missionary to all of inland China, broadened his mission's vision even farther. Nothing less would do but to begin a systematic effort to obey Jesus' command and share the story of his love and sacrifice with every man, woman, and child in all of China. Jenny returned to China with Hudson in 1891, amazed at how much the mission had grown and was still growing. As remarkable as it had seemed in 1887, with a hundred missionaries went to China in one year, in 1890 and 91, the China Inland Mission welcomed 131 new missionaries in Shanghai in less than six months' time, 66 of them arriving in one three-week period. The history of Christian missions had seen nothing like it. And the advances in China weren't limited to the work of the China Inland Mission. Between 1890 and 1895, 1,153 new missionaries went to China through various mission agencies. And the work continued to grow. By 1900, there were 750 China Inland Mission members. Four million dollars had been raised without anyone but God being asked to give. And there was no debt. Over 700 Chinese workers were connected with the mission, and 13,000 Chinese believers have been baptized. Prospects for the brand new century looked even more exciting, with the first steps begun in a deliberately stra strategy designed to reach every person in China with the gospel. But then the Boxer Rebellion of 1900 broke out, and its madness swept the country. With the official blessing of the Dowager Empress, the fanatical boxers rose up from one end of China to the other in religious and patriotic fervor to drive out the devil foreigners. Hudson, his health broken during his tenth term of active missionary work in China, 1898 and 1899, had, at Jenny's insistence, agreed to travel to Switzerland to rest and try to recuperate. They no, no sooner arrived there when the terrible word reached them. Telegram after telegram came telling of riots, massacres, and of hunting down of refugees in station after station of the China Inland Mission. Each new word brought greater and greater sorrow until Hudson weakened emotionally and physically to the point that he thought he could bear no more. I cannot read, he said at that point. I cannot pray. I cannot, cannot scarcely even think. But I can trust. Before the rebellion ended and order was restored in China, thousands had died, including 58 China Inland Missionary members, along with 21 of their children, and countless Chinese converts of the mission. Yet when the violence did end, the China Inland Mission returned to its centers, many of which had been destroyed, and resumed the work without so much as a single demand of the Chinese government for compensation. That attitude of courage and forgiveness made such an impression that helped set the stage for a new era of effective evangelism in China. The words of a white-haired Chinese pastor in Chansi came true. Kingdoms may perish, he said just before he was killed at the Boxer Rebellion, but the Church of Christ can never be destroyed. Hudson stepped down from the directorship of the mission in 1900, and his health prevented his return to China for some time. By the time he regained enough strength for another round-the-world journey, Jenny was herself dying of cancer. So he stayed and cared for her until she died in July of 1904. During her last night, though she had obvious difficulty breathing, she kept assuring Hudson that she felt no pain, no pain. But toward morning, seeing the anguish on his face, she finally whispered, Ask him to take me quickly. Never had Hudson prayed such a difficult prayer, but for his wife's sake he asked God to free her spirit. 
Within five minutes, Jenny's breathing grew quieter, and then all was at peace. Hudson's sense of desolation was unspeakable. On the wall of the Taylor's sitting room hung a scripture text, the last purchase the couple had made together. Many times in the days following Jenny's death, Hudson looked upon this through tears to those words in blue on their white background. It said, Faithful is he who made the promises. He told a friend, All we have to do is look up with patience to see how he will prove it true. Early, early the following year, Hudson sailed with his son and daughter-in-law to China. At 73 years of age, he made a long, remarkable tour of the country that took him to many spots and even into the province of Hunan, where he had never journeyed before. And oh, how the people responded, both missionaries and the Chinese, everywhere he went. He was called Venerable Father and Benefactor of China by many who came to greet him. Crowds gathered to hear him whenever he spoke and sometimes just to see him pass. The trip into Hunan had to be especially gratifying. It was the last of the provinces to get a permanent China Inland Mission Station, and it hadn't been fully accessible until after the Boxer Rebellion. Hudson was anxious to see that part of the country, and as his party crossed the wide expanse of Tongting Lake and steamed upriver toward the capital of Qingsa, he couldn't help but have thought about all the toil and prayer that had gone into opening up the last province of China to the gospel. Less than ten years before, not one missionary had settled there. Now there were no fewer than 111 from 13 different mission agencies with work in 17 different cities and a strong band of Chinese Christians working along with them. The advances were indeed remarkable. A work of God was the only way people could think to describe the impact of Hudson Taylor's life and of the China Inland Mission. But Hudson's response was summed up in the, his words, We cannot do much, but we can do a little, and God can do a great deal. On Saturday, June 30, 1905, the missionaries in Hunan's capital city welcomed Hudson with a reception. That evening, his daughter-in-law went into his room to check on him. Dear Father was in bed, the lamp burning on the chair beside him, and he was leaning over it with his pocketbook lying open, and the home letters it contained spread out as he loved to have them. I drew the pillow up more comfortably under his head and sat down on the low chair close beside him, and he said nothing. I began talking a little about the pictures in the missionary review lying open, open on the bed. And I was just in the middle of a sentence when dear father turned his head quickly and gave a little gasp. I looked up, thinking he was going to sneeze. But another came, then another. He was not choking or distressed for breath. He did not look at me or seem conscious of anything. I ran to the door and called Howard, his son. But before he could reach the bedside, it was evident that the end had come. I ran back to call Dr. Keller, who was just at the foot of the stairs. In less time than it takes to write it, he was with us, but only to see dear father draw his last breath. It was not death, but the glad, swift entry upon life immortal. And oh, the look of rest and calm that came over the dear face was wonderful. The weight of years seemed to pass away in a few moments. The weary lines vanished. He looked like a child quietly sleeping, and the very room seemed full of unutterable peace. Hudson Taylor's body was taken in a casket generously purchased by poor Chinese Christians from the province of Hunan to the family plot in a little cemetery at Xinjiang. There his body was buried beside those of his wife and children on the banks of the mighty Yangtze River, in the heart of the land he loved and lived and died for. And what was to become of the China Inland Mission? Hudson Taylor had been a man of such unusual faith God had always blessed the mission while he lived and prayed for it. But what now? Hudson Taylor's le legacy lived on and continued to grow through the ministry of the China Inland Mission. By the time the Japanese invaded China during the 1930s and the first stages of the Second World War, the mission's membership had swelled to 1,285. The total income since 1900 had reached $20 million unsolicited. There were between three and 4,000 Chinese workers with the mission and the baptisms in the first three decades of the 1900s had totaled more than 100,000. The China Inland Mission, like all Christian organizations, was expelled from China when Mao Zedong and his communists took over the country after World War II. But the mission continues today under the name of Overseas Missionary Fellowship with its headquarters in Singapore and over 1,000 missionaries serving in nine countries throughout Southeast Asia. And the China Inland Mission's impact 
like that of Hudson Taylor himself, lives on today in communist China. Despite the reprehensive decades of communist persecution, the Chinese church, just as during the Boxer Rebellion, could not be destroyed. So that when Western Christians regained a measure of access to inland China, again in the 70s and 80s, the worldwide Christian church learned that there were by then millions of Chinese Christians and thousands of house churches throughout China. And many, if not most of those millions of Chinese Christians, must trace their Christian heritage back to the work of the China Inland Mission and its spiritual father, Hudson Taylor. What was the secret of the spiritual giant's strength? that enabled his life to make such an impact, part of his secret was expressed in the words to one of his favorite verses. He told me of a river bright that flows from him to me that I might be for his delight a fair and fruitful tree. It is very simple, he wrote, but has he not planted us by the river of living water that we may be for his delight fair and fruitful to his people? God came first to Hudson Taylor's life, not the work, not the needs of China or of the mission, not his own experiences. He knew that the promise was true. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. From a practical standpoint, he knew the truth of Oswald Chambers' statement, God does not give us overcoming life. He gives us life as we overcome. And to Hudson Taylor, the secret of over overcoming lay in daily, hourly fellowship with God. This he learned could only be maintained by personal prayer and faithful meditation on God's Word. With the life he lived and its demands on his time and energy, finding opportunity for his own spiritual maintenance wasn't easy, but he made it a priority. On his last journey through China with his son and daughter-in-law, they traveled month after month through northern China by cart and by wheelbarrow, the inns they stayed in by night offered only the crudest accommodations. Often then, there would be only one large room for everyone spending the night in the inn. His children would screen off a portion of the room for their father with curtains of some sort. Then after everyone was asleep, they would be wakened to the sound of a match striking and see the flicker of candlelight which told them Hudson was awake and reading his Bible. From 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. was his usual prayer time, the time he could count on being undisturbed in prayer. And that flicker of candlelight said more to his children about prayer than anything they ever read or heard on the subject. And he not only read it, he lived it. Hudson Taylor stopped at no sacrifice in following Christ. Cross-loving men are needed, he wrote in the midst of his labors in China. And if he could speak to us today, he would no doubt say again, There is a needs be for us to give ourselves for the life of the world. An easy, non-self-denying life will never be one of power. Fruit-bearing involves cross-bearing. There are not two Christs, an easy-going one for easy-going Christians, and a suffering, toiling one for exceptional believers. There is only one Christ. Are you willing to abide in Him and thus to bear much fruit? <laughs>